Here's a paraphrased summary of what we have learned so far about the five different asymptotic notations that we have seen. If the function t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n, then t of n is theta of f of n and it's also big O of f of n and big omega of f of n. Recall that theta of f of n is the set of all functions having the same rate of growth as f of n. So if t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n, then t of n is going to be part, a, a member of this set theta of f of n. Big O of f of n was defined to be the set of functions that either has the same rate of growth as f of n or has a smaller rate of growth than f of n. So if t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n, t of n is going to be a member of big O of f of n. And similarly, big omega of f of n also contains functions that have the same rate of growth as f of n, besides functions that have a larger rate of growth than f of n. So if t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n, it's going to be a member of these three sets. What if t of n has a smaller rate of growth than f of n? Then it's a member of big O of f of n and it's also a member of little o of f of n. If you recall, little o of f of n was the set of functions that exclusively have a smaller rate of growth than f of n. And big O of f of n contains functions that have the same rate of growth as f of n and a smaller rate of growth than f of n. The third possibility is that t of n can ha uh, has a larger rate of growth than f of n, in which case it's a member of big omega of f of n and little omega of f of n. Little omega of f of n was the set of functions that exclusively have a larger rate of growth than f of n. And Big omega of f of n was the set of functions which either have the same rate of growth as f of n or a larger rate of growth than f of n. So instead of uh, writing big omega, big O and theta of f of n on the left hand side and on the right hand side define uh, and on the right hand side defining them based on the, what the rates of growth of t of n are relative to f of n, I have changed the order. I have written the what, what we saw on the right hand side on the left hand side and I have mapped back what was on the left hand side to the right hand side. So these are the three possible cases for the rate of growth of t of n relative to f of n. Now the question is, how do we show that t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n? So we are asking about case 1 here, but in general we will be looking at how we can show that, how we can show that t of n is, has the same rate of growth or a smaller rate of growth or a larger rate of growth. One, uh, we have been seeing some ways to show that because we, in, in previous examples that we've taken, we have, we have basically been arguing for t of n being a member of one of these five sets and that was by implicitly showing that it either has the same or a smaller or a larger rate of growth than f of n. But we're going to look at a simpler way to show these things. Suppose we compute the limit of n tending to infinity, the ratio of t of n to f of n. How does this ratio, what does this ratio evaluate to as n tends to infinity? There are three possibilities. Either this ratio could be zero or it could be some positive constant let's call it c that's greater than 0 or it could be infinity. 
it can't be negative because uh, t of n and f of n are non-negative functions. And of course there is a fourth possibility where there may not be a well-defined limit but let's leave that aside for now. When t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n we claim that t of n is, is, is bounded from below by some constant multiple of f of n or t of n can be bounded from below by some multiple of f of n and bounded from above by some other multiple of some other constant multiple of f of n. Now if we just bring f of n on the right hand side of this inequality we get t of n divided by f of n is greater than or equal to c1 and remember that we are looking at this inequality we are saying that this inequality can uh, should hold for all values of, of n that are very large. Likewise t of n by f of n should be less than or equal to c2 and because both these constants c1 and c2 were positive in effect if we can show that the ratio of t of n divided by f of n converges to some positive constant we will have shown this inequality because if, if this ratio converges to some positive constant c then we can choose c1 to be c by 2 and we can choose c2 to be any constant larger than c say twice of c and in that case this inequality is going to hold t of n is going to be bounded from below by some constant multiple of f of n and it's bounded it's going to be bounded from above by some constant multiple of f of n what this means is that if the ratio of t of n to f of n converges to some constant c then t of n is going to belong to theta of n and it's also going to belong by implication to big O of n and big omega of n. So to say that t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n is to say that their ratio converges to some positive constant c. As an example the quadratic expression a n square plus b n plus c grows at the same rate as n square because if we take the ratio of a n square plus b n plus c and n square as n tends to infinity this ratio converges to the value a the positive constant a because we can write this as a plus b by n plus c by n square and as n tends to infinity these two terms will converge to zero so the value of this limit is going to be a this means that a n square plus b n plus c is in theta of n square and it's also in big O of n square and big omega of n square. Right? So if t of n has the same rate of growth as f of n, then t of n is big theta of f of n, and it's also big O of f of n and big omega of f of n. So this is case one where the limit converges to some positive constant greater than zero. What happens if the limit is exactly equal to zero? What that implies is that t of n has a smaller rate of growth than f of n. So we are looking at a case where t of n is going to be bounded from above by f of n regardless of what constant we choose. I consider this this strong this, this strong claim about f, f of n being an upper bound. If t of n is less than or equal to any constant multiple of f of n, that is for all constants c greater than 0, this can happen only if t of n has a smaller rate of growth than f of n. And one way to capture that 
is to say that the ratio of t of n to f of n is going to be zero. Because if the ratio is zero, it doesn't matter what the value of this constant is. As long as it's a constant, the limit is going to be zero. As an example, a n squared plus b n plus c has a smaller rate of growth than n cubed. And we can see that by taking the ratio of a n squared plus b n plus c to n cubed. So this becomes a by n plus b by n squared plus c by n cubed. All three terms have n in the denominator. So as n tends to infinity, the ratio is going to tend to zero. So you can see that the rate of growth of a n squared plus b n plus c, which is quadratic, is smaller than a cubic rate of growth. And when there are when the rates of growth are different, then if you take the ratio of one function to the other and increase and look at what happens when n becomes very, very large, the ratio is going to converge to zero. Or if you if you're looking at if you so this is case two where we are looking at t of n having a smaller rate of growth than f of n. But we can look at the other case where the ratio tends to infinity and that happens when t of n has a larger rate of growth than f of n. For example, the quadratic function a n squared plus b n plus c has a larger rate of growth than n and we can see that by taking the ratio and seeing what happening when n tends to infinity. This ratio then will turn will will be infinite. So, what this means is that a n squared plus b n plus c has a larger rate of growth than n, and so a n squared plus b n plus c belongs to big omega of n, and it belongs to little omega of n. If t of n has a larger rate of growth than f of n. And d of n is big omega of f of n and little omega of f of n. Likewise, in for case 2, if t of n has a smaller rate of growth than f of n, that is if the ratio in the limit is 0, then, then it means that t of n is in big theta of f of n and sorry, in, in big O of f of n and little o of f of n. Now taking these ratios and allowing n to tend to infinity and calculating what the value of the ratio is in the limit is actually much simpler than using the definitions and working with the definitions the way we've been doing. The reason we have looked at definitions so far is that we need to understand those definitions properly. And the examples that we have, uh, the numerous examples that we have taken so far, allowed us to explore those definitions more carefully. The definitions of theta of f of n, the definition of uh, big O of f of n, and uh, the other asymptotic notations we saw. But for many problems, it's sufficient to just take the limit of n tending to infinity, t of n divided by f of n, and seeing what the value of that ratio is. If the value of that ratio is 0, that proves that t of n is big O of f of n. It also proves that t of n is little o of f of n. If the value of the ratio is some con some positive constant c, then the rates of growth of t of n and f of n are the same. In this case, t of n had a smaller rate of growth than f of n. And in the third case, t of n has a larger rate of growth than f of n when the value of the ratio is infinite. And if the value of the ratio is some positive constant, t of n is known to be in theta of f of n big O of f of n and big omega of f of n. And if the value of their ratio is infinite, then t of n is known to be in big omega of f of n and little omega of f of n. So if you want to, if you are given a function 
and if you are asked whether whether or not the function belongs to big theta of some other function or big o of some other function or big omega of some other function and so on you can take the ratio of the two functions and see what their rates of their relative rates of growth are if the relative rates of growth are the same when you take the ratio you're going to end up with some positive constant c if the relative ratios are different it's possible that the they could be different in two ways the first function could be smaller could have a smaller rate of growth than the second function or the first function could have a larger rate of growth than the second function if it has a smaller rate of growth than the second function then it's going to be bounded from above by any constant multiple of the second function and if it has a larger rate of growth than the second function then it's going to be bounded from below by any constant multiple of the second function and so it's going to fall into one of these two cases depending on whether the ratio is zero or whether the ratio is infinite